Hello, um, my name is Keith Giles, and um, in this session, I'm going to be talking about the importance of embracing mystery. But bef before I jump into that, uh, I've been asked to give you guys a little bit of a background about myself, if you don't know who I am. Um, I'm an author. Um, I have published seven books in a series called the Jesus Un series of books. Uh, those include Jesus Untangled, Crucifying Our Politics, The Pledge of Allegiance to the Lamb, uh, Jesus Unbound, uh, Liberating the Word of God from the Bible, Jesus Undefeated, which looks at the doctrine of eternal torment, Jesus Unforsaken, which examines penal substitution and what's going on in the cross, uh, and several other titles. Uh, I have a, a brand new book coming out on this topic that I'll be sharing with you um, in this session. Uh, the book is called Sola Mysterium, Embracing the Beautiful Uncertainty of Everything, and it features a foreword by Dr. Steve McVeigh. And so I'm very excited and very passionate about this topic um, and the importance of embracing mystery. Um, my wife Wendy and I have been married for about 36 years, and um, we met in El Paso, Texas, going to college at the University of Texas in El Paso. Um, and uh, we lived for 25 years in Southern California. We have two boys who are now themselves have graduated college and have moved on uh, to other places and living their lives in different states. And my wife Wendy and I moved back recently to El Paso, Texas, and where we currently live. Um, and we continue uh, to do what we can to um, live out the calling of, of Christ in our own lives and uh, in the world around us in various ways. So uh, that's just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been asked before I jump into my session here on embracing mystery to spend a little time thinking about the future of um, religion, of the church, and of spirituality. And I'm going to briefly touch on each of those three things because I think those are three different things. Um, when we talk about the future of the church, I would say from my vantage point as somebody who was licensed and ordained as a pastor, served on staff as a pastor in probably a half dozen churches over, the, over you know, a 25-year period, um, I've been on staff at churches, I've been in leadership at churches, I've consulted with churches, and um, made a decision to step away from all of that. My wife and I uh, left sort of traditional church ministry for a, a church that we had helped to plant in Southern California, and uh, we started a, a gathering, what you might call a house church. Um, but we had no statement of faith, we had no uh, formal leadership, we had no 501c3, tax exempt status, we had no bank account, um, any of those things. Um, we were just a collection of people that loved Jesus and wanted to love one another and love our neighbors and, uh, and follow Jesus the best that we could in the teachings of Jesus in our, in our daily lives. And uh, it was a wonderful experience, but um, as someone who has um, been in leadership at that level of being on staff at churches and um, and then having uh, facilitated and hosted a gathering that's non-structured, non-hierarchical, uh, you know, no leadership, no money, <laughs> um, you know, arguments or disagreements or things, anything like that. All the, all the offerings that we collected all went straight to help people that were living in poverty in our community and things like that. And, um, but church in general, if I had to guess, uh, I would say that church, the future of church is not looking good, at least for the institution. Uh, as I'm recording this, uh, only a week or so ago, um, a report was published, uh, a study and a report that was done, an investigative study was published, um, detailing hundreds of accounts and examples of sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Church. This is the denomination that I was raised in and that I my license and ordination was in. And so I served on staff at Southern Baptist Churches for many years. Still have friends that are part of that organization. I am no longer. 
thankfully, part of that organization anymore. Um, but the Southern Baptist denomination is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. And um, this is a pretty devastating story, um, revelation, that the same kinds of abuses that for decades, you know, Protestants have almost gleefully pointed out in the Catholic Church, like, oh, look at these Catholics, L look how screwed up they are, it's because they have, uh, they don't do it the way we do it, it's because they don't have the right theology, it's because they don't understand Jesus, it's because they worship Mary, it's because they have whatever, they won't let their priest marry, or whatever, we've, we've pointed at them and mocked them and made fun of them, used these priest scandals that are horrible, right, these uh, priests that have abused young people, uh, boys and girls, and how the Catholic Church has covered it up and moved them around and reassigned them, knowing they were predators, knowing they were offenders, uh, abusers, etc. Um, well, now the truth is revealed that the Southern Baptist Church, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, has been doing the exact same thing um, all along. And um, this is just what we know about. Who knows how much is going on right now that hasn't been exposed yet. I will also say, and, and if you yourself have been on staff at churches in the past, um, or if you are now on staff at a, at a church, um, you probably have experienced something similar. I, I was just reflecting, my wife Wendy and I were talking just uh, the other day, and I was saying, you know, I was, well, I was recalling that of the probably close to six or seven churches that I served at in various capacities over the, over the 25 years, um, I think only one of them didn't have a sex scandal of some kind, at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, but all of, all the rest of them, you know, yeah, you were aware of things that went on uh, that shouldn't have gone on. And some of those things were exposed and the people were held accountable. But it, in the process, it devastated families. Uh, it ruined people's faith. Um, it was, you know, horrible. But in other cases, uh, people tried to cover them up to try to keep it from coming out or to put the spin on it so that the worst of it was never really known, and et cetera. And so, yeah, those are pretty horrible things um, that I, just, just in my life, in my limited experience, that I have seen as well. So I think the institution of the church uh, is in trouble. I think these kinds of things will only continue to cause people in the pews uh, to question their leadership, question their theology, question their denomination, and many of them will, if they haven't already, will decide that they're done with organized religion and will walk away. So again, I, I think, and well, by the way, that's already been happening. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact statistic, but I believe it was something like 23 million. Um, it was in the millions. I believe it was 23 million people have uh, been leaving the Southern Baptist denomination over the last, you know, uh, six or seven years. Um, and it just continues to happen. And these kinds of things, now that more of these things are coming out, more truth is coming out about the kinds of abuses that have happened and that have been covered up. Um, I, I expect that number to continue. I can't imagine that it would stop or reverse, right? So um, I would say the church as an institution is in trouble. Now, the way I define, though, a true church, um, I, I think it's a, it's a mistake to define church as the building on the corner, uh, that is not uh, that is not uh, exactly the way. Or the earliest Christians defined church. Church was defined as us, the people, and so um, people who love Jesus and who come together because they love Jesus to encourage each other and and bless each other and serve one another um, and encourage one another, etc. Um, that will never go away. I don't believe. I think that is not in jeopardy because I think that's just a natural thing that people do. Uh, people that have faith uh, tend to want to be in relationship with people who also have faith so that it can encourage one another and uh, bless one another um, and support one another. Those, by the way, there's 58 one another's in the New Testament. And I personally feel like that that's the problem with church as we have known it uh, is because um, we have created a man-made structure, not a, not a, I hate to say this biblical, but it's not a, a biblical or even an historical Christian structure of uh, what Jesus specifically uh, set up originally, put it, put it that way, 
what, what Jesus originally described was a family, uh, a genuine family, not one we just say we're family, but there's still a boss and a CEO and an organization and a staff who are paid money. Like, that's not a family. I don't know about your family. My family doesn't work that way. Uh, that's not the way it operates. I can't fire my my wife or my children. If I do, then we're not a family anymore, right? Um, so anyway, uh, I, I, by the way, uh, if you're curious about all of that, I do have a book on that called Jesus Unveiled, which goes into much more detail on all that. So I don't want to get us off track, but I would just say um, church as an institution is in trouble, uh, but true church as far as just the people of God, the body of Christ, um, without all those structures, I think that is uh, is fine. Uh, it'll, it'll, people will continue to find one another and support one another and encourage one another. Um, and then spirituality, I think, is also uh, a positive thing. I think there, uh, I could say that um, more and more people are finding God outside of church or religion. And, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my talk. So I think that's enough. Talk about predicting the future because I don't really know the future and of course no, no one does. So let's get into our, our topic um, for this session which is embracing mystery. So here's the thing. Um, I just want to encourage everybody uh, on the importance of um, embracing mystery and and here's why. Well because um, I run this thing a, a couple of years ago I started something called Square One. And um, it's, it's a sort of a 12-week course, but it's also a community of people. There's over 100 people involved in this community. Uh, and it's specifically helping people, walking them through step-by-step step their deconstruction process and helping them, helping them sort of map out their own path to reconstruction. I don't tell anybody how to do that because I don't think anybody can. And, um, but anyway, I've been doing this now for a long time. Over 100 people have gone through the, the, the course and the, are part of the community, and uh, that's been a wonderful thing. I've loved being able to do that. And, but one of the primary things that I urge everyone to do, really from the beginning, uh, when they enter the Square One course and community, is to do this. I say to them, this is exactly what I say. Um, in all of your deconstructing of your theology, your beliefs, etc., I want to really encourage you, and I want to encourage all of you watching this, the same. Deconstruct your need to be right. Because when we insist on being right, and that means we must prove everyone else is wrong, we become the very sorts of people who, if we remember, those are the kinds of people who pushed us out into the desert, right? They rejected us because we disagreed with them. So I want us to move away from thinking about unity as agreement. And I want us to re reconsider um, what our deconstruction really, what the goal of our deconstruction is. That you're, The goal of deconstruction is not to be right and to prove that you're right. And again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but this is something I think is so critical that we understand. If we're not careful... You know, we can go from uh, our fundamentalism or evangelicalism, um, our doctrines, and we can, we can deconstruct those beliefs. And then now we have a different belief, what we believe is a better belief, a more quote-unquote true belief. But then we're still arguing with people that we're right and they're wrong, and we haven't really left our fundamentalism behind. We've just sort of become fundamentalist deconstructionalists, where we're fundamental, fundamentally... Uh, we've deconstructed, but we're still behaving in a, this fundamentalist way of thinking. And we have to, I would encourage you, your life will be much better if you can learn to leave that need to be right behind. Um, and so you can be right in your theology, but you can be very, very wrong if um, being right is more important to you than people, right? So you can be right or you can be loving. But it's really hard to be both. I don't think you can be both if you insist on being right and proving that you're right. So, bottom line, let's not become fundamentalists of, of deconstruction. Let's, let's let go of our need to be right and learn to accept people as they are without feeling the need to change them um, in some way. Um, so, the other reason why I think it's super important for us to let go of being right is that being right and being certain is an illusion anyway. It's not 
real. And what do I mean by that? So let me just briefly point out what I mean and why why I want you to <laughs> what I want you to do is reconsider what it is you think you know. Because on a very basic fundamental level, you know, we most of us believe, well, I believe what I see. Like I I, I can I see I know what I see with my own eyes. If I see something with my own two eyes, I believe it. I know it's true. I know it's real. I, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, right? But is that true? Because here's the thing. Um, you know, our eyes are only uh, capable of perceiving um, a very narrow range of light. It's called the visible light range. And specifically, that's the colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very set range of light called visible light that our eyes can perceive. But now we know because of science, because of um, instruments and things like this, um, that there's way more light than just this, than this little narrow band that we can see with our eyes. We know that there is ultraviolet light, there is x-ray, there's gamma rays, there's infrared. Uh, and so in going, going off in both directions, both this way and this way, um, there is more light going on right now in the universe, in the room around you and me, than we are perceiving at this very moment. And so understand that the light that you do see with your eyes is not all the light that there is. There is way more light, way, way more going on in the spectrum of visible light, or spectrum of light uh, beyond the visible light that you and I are capable of perceiving. So we don't even see all of reality. In other words, all of reality would be the, inc the entire range of light, which is going on all the time all around us. But what we can perceive is only this much. And by the way, the same is true with our ears, with sound. You could say, well, I believe my ears. I know what I heard. Yes, but do you? I mean, you do maybe know what you heard, but is what you heard all that there was to know uh, about what, was, what sounds were out there? In the same way, we know that we can only hear with our ears a very limited range of sound. And there is sound frequency that goes higher than our ears can perceive, and that would be like um, radar, sonar, things like this, right? Uh, like bats there are living beings who have ears that are capable of hearing higher frequencies. Dogs are also another example who can hear frequencies at this very moment that are going on in the room and the world around us that they can hear that we cannot hear. And going on the lower end of the spectrum of sound, there is infrasound, that um, animals, there are some animals that can create these infrasounds um, that we can't hear with our ears, um, but they're there, they exist. So that would be whales or there's some tigers that can do infrasound and elephants and things like that. And so again, in the same way, our ears can only hear a very narrow band of, of sound frequency, but that is not all the frequency that there is to hear. So we do not see all of reality, we do not hear all of reality, we do not experience all of reality through our five senses. We are very limited in our capacity and our ability to know reality in that way, okay? Um, and I would even challenge this idea too of our memory. Uh, I've done some incredible research on, um, well, I, I've done research on some incredible uh, studies that have been done on, um, on this idea of memory. And several of these uh, studies that were done on memory uh, were really, really fascinating. One of, the, one of the researchers, one of the doctors involved in leading one of these studies, uh, in, in the summary that she did after doing years, like you know, over a decade of study on human memory, um, this is what she concluded. She said, the human memory is like a Wikipedia page that you can edit and others can edit too. And what, is she, what do I mean by that? Well, that we edit our own memories over time. Uh, there was one study done where they, uh, again, over, like a, over a decade, they interviewed children and they asked them on camera uh, to tell them something that had just happened you know, recently in their life. And it could be anything. They, they crashed their bike, uh, a dog chased them, uh, their grandmother died, 
uh, they won a contest, whatever it was. Just tell us a story uh, on camera. Tell us this memory. That something that just happened to you very, very recently, right? And so they filmed them. And then every year they would bring these people back, same kids, and over 10 years, um, interview them again on camera and, and then would say, hey, remember the thing you talked about last time? Um, tell us the memory again. Share the what you what you remember about what happened. And they did this every year for 10 years. And the at the end of the 10 years, um, these people, you know, who were maybe 10 or 11 years old, now they're in their 20s, um, they, they now have, you know, 10 years worth of recordings of them over a 10-year period telling the same memory. And when they played it all for them, what they noticed was the story, the memory changed over time. And so, you know, the 20-year-old um, now is, is telling you, oh, here's what I remember happening. And, and they're saying, no, that's not what happened. Well, what do you mean? Of course it is. Well, then they would play them the video from the original video, the very, very first video when they were kids, and say, well, here's, here's the memory that when it just happened, when it was fresh, here's what you said about it. And the details were different. And so details had been added or removed or edited over time. And by the way, we all do this. Um, I, I'll give you an experiment in just a second. But uh, another th interesting thing about um, this, uh, this ability of, uh, of ourselves to edit our own memories, um, one of the studies that was done was actually specifically focused on bringing in a, a, a group of people and convincing them of a memory in their past of something um, that never happened to them. So in other words, they, they convinced people, uh, let's say like a, a dog chased them and bit them and, um, and, and they had this traumatic experience of this dog chasing them and biting them, right? Now, it didn't happen. It's not a real memory. But they could convince people I think it was something like 80% of the people involved in the study, they managed to convince them, totally convince them that this was a real memory when it was not a real memory. And then they did another series of experiments um, where they took real memories. People would share with them like something that really happened to them. And then they would convince them that that was made up, that it never really happened. And it worked in both directions. And again, about an 80% success rate. So our memories are malleable, they are editable, um, and we do it ourselves, and other people are capable of giving us memories that aren't real, or of changing memories, or, or um, erasing memories that are real. Let's just do a quick experiment, um, and I know this is going to be kind of weird on a video, uh, but I've done this several times uh, when I've done talks with people on this subject, so uh, trust me, okay? Uh, so I want you to do me a favor. Just for, this, just for a few seconds, I want you to, to play along with me, do this with me, okay? It's going to be fun. So close your eyes, okay? And what I want you to do is think of a childhood memory. And let's think of a good memory, okay? So it could be when you were riding a bike with your friends. It could be uh, swimming or having a holiday. Maybe you went to Disneyland. Uh, maybe it's just a picnic or an outing you did with your family, but think of a, just try to think of a memory when you were a child, okay, when you were young. And then, so I want you now, hold on to that memory. Really, really sit in that memory for a second, okay? So I want you to see the memory. I want you to pay attention to the details, if you can, if you can remember. You know, what was the weather like? Was it hot? Was it cold? Um, how did you feel? Were you happy? Were you, were you a little sad? Were you upset? Or... Uh, you know, what, what was going on with you emotionally there? Um, what are the people around you doing? What are they wearing? And how are they interacting with you? So just, just sit in this memory for just a little bit. I want to keep your eyes closed and just really explore this memory, hopefully a good memory uh, of your past, right? Okay? Okay, so let's open your eyes. Now I'm going to ask you some, a real simple question about the memory that you just uh, relived, Okay. When you were reliving that memory, was it a first person? Were you looking at your hands the way you would if it was a real, actual memory? Or were you looking at yourself as if you were a cameraman standing there 
making a home movie of yourself. So, for example, if you're riding your bike with your friends, are you seeing yourself as if you were standing on the road and you watch yourself ride by on the bike? Or maybe it's even like a floating shot next to yourself, you know, tracking with you as you're riding your bike. Or if you're swimming, do you kind of, from, from the edge of the pool, are you looking down, do you see yourself in the pool swimming and playing and laughing? Whatever the memory was, do you see yourself from outside of your body? If you do, and by the way, if you do, the vast majority of people, when they remember a childhood memory, that's the way they remember it. They remember it as, as if they're watching a movie that someone has filmed outside of their body. But you and I all can, can think about it for a second. Was there somebody there filming that? Is that? Do you have that film in your head? that somebody shot with a motion picture camera outside of your body? Well, of course not. So what are you, what are you remembering if you are stepping outside of your body and watching a movie of yourself experiencing that memory? Well, what you're watching in your memory is, again, not the actual memory. The true memory would be a first-person context. You'd see your hands, and your, if you look down, you'd see your feet. Uh, if you were riding a bike, you would see your hands and the handlebars, but you wouldn't see your face. You wouldn't pay attention. You wouldn't be able to see your own face, right? There's no mirror there. There's no camera on the outside of your body. So what we do is your brain, everyone's brain, um, especially with childhood memories, will tend to make a little movie in our heads. We'll make a, a movie of the memory and we'll save a movie that we have created in our heads of the event. And then when we recall it, we just watch that movie again. But that movie isn't reality. And because your brain is making a movie of the event, it's not getting the details correct because it's a movie. It's, not, it's trying to recreate the experience for you so that you can remember the experience. But it is not recording your actual, what your eyes actually saw in that moment, because if it was, again, it would be first person. So we really can't trust what we see with our eyes. We really can't trust what we hear with our ears. And we really can't even trust our own memories of our own life. And so if we can't truly trust with certainty what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears, what we even remember in our own brains about our own life experience, then um, let me also suggest to you that that kind of knowing and that kind of certainty um, is an illusion. And especially if we now move to talking about God. If we're going to talk about theology, can we talk about God with any sense of certainty? Well, I want to say no, because by definition, God is um, a being who, which transcends knowledge, which which um, goes beyond our ability to fully know and comprehend. With what? Our brain, our mind, our eyes, our ears, our senses. Um, how can we know God when God is far, far, far beyond even the range of, of light, not just visible light, but all light? If God is even beyond the range of the frequency of all sound, of all reality. And so... When we're talking about belief and we're talking about faith, we have to remember the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's certainty. And so, of course, now this is the struggle because for many of us um, human beings, we are nature, we are curious by nature, right? we can't help ourselves. We love mystery, but what we love most about mystery is finding the answers, right? <laughs> but what I'm saying is we need to move away from answers and learn to hold loosely to these things, to, to acknowledge that we don't know and to say that's okay. Um, and if you think about it, many of the best things um, are things that we, that we don't know the answers to. Like, uh, just for a second, let's take it to the realm of, like, uh, entertainment, right? If you like Star Wars, like, uh, I watched, the, you know, Star Wars, The New Hope, and Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi when I was a kid in the movie theaters, and I love those movies. Um, and when it talked about the Force, you know, it didn't tell us anything about the Force other than it was just this mysterious thing, the Force. And certain people had some un unexplainable ability to tap into this 
ability and this power and manipulate the force to do some really amazing things. They could lift ships and throw rocks and, you know, choke people from across the room and just all kinds of crazy stuff uh, with the force, right? And it was the mystery about it. Like, we knew enough, but not everything about it. Well, then later on the other movies, they told us, oh, no, it's uh, the force are these midichlorians, these little microscopic organisms in your bloodstream where we can do a blood test and find out if you have these. It was like, what? This is horrible. You just ruined it. And, and, and so many times, that's what happens. Uh, I used to love the show Lost. And uh, when the TV show Lost you know, first started, there are these people on this weird island, and there's this strange creature on the island, and they, they, they don't even really see it. They just see trees moving and you know, things being thrown around and you know, people disappearing, and oh my gosh, what is this? And it was so interesting and fascinating. It just drew you in, the sort of mystery of this island and this creature, and what was it? Well, if you watch the show like I did, as the show went along, they explained more and more and more about answering those questions. And the more answers we got, the worse it became. Um, it was just better when I didn't know. But the minute you started to tell me, oh, it's a smoke monster. What's a smoke monster? Oh, it's this guy that betrayed his brother and his, mo his mom was some goddess, Athena, or whatever. It's like, what? That's lame. I don't even want to know that, right? I want to go back to when I didn't know this. Um, and so... Again, it be, kind of kind of become um, an eternal struggle for us because, on the one hand, we do love mysteries. Mysteries draw us in, and but again, our need to know the answers sometimes becomes this little Chinese finger trap, where the harder we pull, the tighter it holds us, and the more frustrated we become. Right, um, and yet it's holding that tension of being curious and being interested, but but never really getting the answer. That's really what this is about, I believe, when we are encountering God. Because at least in this life, we will never know for certain everything or almost really anything about God. In fact, to put it another way, um, think, about, think about everything that you know about God for certain. Tell me, you know, think about it. Like if you were to make a list or if you had this giant... Uh, swimming pool and you you know you were going to start throwing things into the swimming pool of of everything that you know for sure about god well i don't know about you i don't think i would be able to throw more than one thing into that pool uh of what i know about god because god is just beyond knowing right it's it's, it's impossible but now if i flipped it around if i said now let's fill that swimming pool with everything you don't understand and everything you don't know about god well, you're going to need a bigger swimming pool because that's just everything. Uh, I don't know really anything, uh, or at least hardly anything, about God. And so I just want us to become comfortable with this idea of mystery. So um, it's like this, uh, like a song. There's a song lyric that says, uh, you're doing it wrong, uh, dissecting the bird, trying to find the song. To me, that's a little bit what it's like when we try to understand God uh, with our limited language and capacity of understanding. Um, it's like when you see a bird singing in a tree and you grab the bird and you start cutting it open trying to find the song. Well, I know it's in there. I heard it. I heard it coming out. So the song is in there somewhere. But like the, you're just going about it the wrong way. And so much to me of theology is like that. Uh, we are cutting this bird apart to try to find the song without realizing that the minute you start to do that, you've killed the bird and you've killed the song and you'll never find it. And this is sort of the way, because the way we approach knowing God quite often is about certainty. It's about, it's about taking God out of this infinite capacity and pulling God down into something that can be put into a box, into a book, into a theology. And now it's like God now is our little, we captured God somehow and God is on our leash. And that, whatever that is, that's not God. Uh, there's a great quote by Archibald McLeish that says, religion is at its best when it makes us ask hard questions of ourselves. It is at its worst when it deludes us into thinking we have all the answers for everybody else. And so if you are intrigued by God, if you are compelled by this great unknown mystery of God, and you begin searching for truth when it comes to God, the trick is not to settle 
so quickly, as we often do, for the easy answer or the obvious solution. Because if you do, I want to guarantee you, you will never venture any further. At whatever point you say, I've got it, I understand it, I've got it, right at that point is where you stop. And for most of us, we are, if again, using the swimming pool analogy, um, that's like wading into a swimming pool and headed towards this ocean, you know, bound in bottomless ocean, uh, but we barely get up to our ankles and we stop and go, I got it, I figured it out. Because we settle so quickly for what we think we know about God, and when there's an entire ocean out there that we, you couldn't even possibly begin. The minute you think you know the answers, you stop questioning. You, you stop becoming curious or interested, right? And so there is an infinitely deeper well of mystery for us to uncover and discover, and it lies far beyond the easy answers that we've been given and handed to us, many of us, uh, early on. And part of it is this. Um, I think when we talk about knowing God, too often we think about knowing God in terms of information. Meaning, do I have the correct information about God? And that's not the way that word is used. Uh, in the New Testament, whenever, uh, so in John 17, 3, Jesus uh, makes this statement. He says, you know, this is eternal life, that they would know God and his Son, whom he has sent. But again, that word there, know, there's, there are two words in the Greek. There are two sort of two different types of knowing in the Greek. Um, one way of knowing is information, and that the Greek word for that is episteme. And the other word for knowing is uh, the Greek word gnosko, and that word is the word for intimacy, the way you a husband would know his wife, almost in this euphemism of when a husband knows his wife, she becomes pregnant. <laughs> she conceives uh, new life. And that's not about information, my friends, uh, if you're doing it right. It's not about information. Uh, but it is a complete surrender and sharing of intimacy with the other, the other person, right? This is the word Jesus uses. Jesus says in John 17, 3, eternal life is to gnosko God, to have this intimacy with God, the way a husband is intimate with his wife and, and with Christ, that we would gnosko God, that we would gnosko Christ. So knowing God is not about knowing information, facts, bullet points, theology. No, it's to have a connection on the soul level, right? A spiritual connection and possibly, yes, a physical connection, uh, something that just that transcends just, you know, information and knowledge and goes into the spiritual, into the uh, emotional uh, experience of God. And this is really exciting. And so if we can shift our perspective, our idea of what does it mean to know God, it's not about information, it's about this intimacy. And again, this is the reason why I, I urge people who are deconstructing, um, deconstruct your need to be right. Because, you know, the funny thing about your worldview is no matter how many times it changes, you're always right. And yes, that's true, right? I, I used to believe this, and I was right until I read a book or, or thought about it or, or you know watched a, a lecture or something, and then I said, oh my gosh, now I believe something different. Now I'm right, and then I believe that for a long time, and then I think about it some more, and I read another book, and I go to another presentation. Next thing I know, oh, no, I changed it again. Now I believe this other thing, and now I'm right. And so you were right over here, and you were right over here, and you think you're right now, and yeah, in a way it's true that every time your worldview changes, you're always right. But here's the other way of thinking of it. You were wrong before. You're probably wrong about some things now. And you are going to probably be wrong again in the future. So therefore, uh, don't, don't define your spirituality by being right. Don't define your connection with God by being right. Because it's not about being right. And most of the time, we are so wrong. And, and so again, this is this important shift that we need to have. I, I urge you to hold loosely to your beliefs. You are not your beliefs. That's the other thing. Many times people have such a connection with their beliefs, they, th they think their beliefs are who they are. That's why they get so offended when someone challenges their belief. So again, if we, need, if we can hold loosely to these things and recognize that in the past, 
each time our beliefs changed, did we become different people all of a sudden? No, I'm the same person all the way through. I can look at pictures of myself I, all the way back through those those theological changes that I made, and I, well, there I am, and there I am, and there I am. It's all me. Um, my beliefs change, but I am the same person. So don't let the cement dry. Keep it wet. It's okay. Um, don't let it harden. It's going to be better for you in the long run. Richard Rohr, who I love, says, uh, God is always bigger than the boxes we build for God. So we should not waste too much time protecting our boxes. When we insist on being right, we make ourselves the standard for truth in the whole universe. Right? It's like, oh, I'm not wrong. You are. Right? It's like this comedian, George Carlin, uh, he had this great little thing he talks about. You know, ever noticed how everyone driving faster than you is insane and everyone driving slower than you is an idiot? Well, all that is is exactly, it, it, it's, it's a metaphor for our theology, right? Anybody, whatever I believe is correct, is the right thing. I'm right. I'm not wrong. I'm right. Um, so if somebody is progressive, they're, they're ahead of me. They are, they're, they're more liberal than me about uh, some theology. Oh, that person is, is insane. But if somebody is behind me, they're way more conservative. Or they're, they're, much more, they're less progressive than I am. Well, they're idiots. They're just stupid. I can't believe they would believe that, right? So what you're doing when you behave that way is you're saying, I am the standard for all truth in the universe. And if you agree with me, you're good. You're right. And you're normal. But if you're more progressive than me, you're insane. And if you're less progressive than me, uh, you're an idiot. This is not the way to do theology. This is not the way to live our lives. It's not the way to interact with other people. Unfortunately, we've probably experienced this. Christianity in America is so much about having the right information. We act as if this is what the gospel is, that it's about information. And therefore, to have the wrong information is the greatest heresy. But I would suggest that the gospel is not about information or having the right information about God, uh, because in a way that's really impossible. No, that the gospel is truly about transformation. And again, transformation is going back to gnosko. It's having a connection, a real, actual, intimate connection with the creator of the universe in some mystical, metaphysical, spiritual way that, that again, transcends knowledge. And of course, you know, we know throughout history, uh, we can go and study, right? Uh, it's often the ones who are the most convinced that they are right who end up torturing, burning, crucifying, and putting to death all of those who dare to ask a question or have a doubt about their particular theology. We don't want to get into that trap, do we? We don't want to be like that. And so we want to let go. Embracing mystery is essential to healthy Christ-like theology. My friend Ken Tanner uh, posted this recently on Facebook. He said, if you would be a theologian or pursue any kind of wisdom, get comfortable saying things like this. I don't know. It's complicated. I was wrong. Let me think about that. See, this is the way we need to shift in our thinking. It's okay to not know the answers. It's okay to not be right about everything. Um, and so, again, that's kind of what I want to encourage you all uh, to embrace if you can. Um, it's so important for us to be able to do this. Because once the cement dries, our sense of wonder and curiosity are totally dead. So yes, curiosity may kill the cat, but it gives life to those who are seeking truth and wanting to know gnosko God. Theology, if it's a study of a being that's beyond everyone's imagination, theology has to be, from the beginning, step one, the assumption is, this is about mystery and embracing mystery. Because God, God's self, is a mystery. And so we cannot claim to be certain about a being of unimaginable complexity and transcendent reality. Certainty is the best way to stop thinking and to stop living. And so, again, we see this with Jesus. You know, Jesus wasn't concerned about everybody having the right answers to things. And if you look at the way he teaches, it's, he told parables. Let me tell you, if your goal is to communicate exact, specific information to people, you don't tell open-ended stories with multiple you know, possible meanings and then walk away having never explained them. He'll explain like one, maybe two parables in all four of the Gospels. And every other parable Jesus told, he just told the parable and walked away. And he was comfortable with the fact that People might get different answers, have different understandings of that parable, and that was fine. That was okay. Um, 
And so to approach God, to know Christ in this way, we have to do so with a well-developed sense of awe and wonder because we are dealing with mysteries that are too great for us to imagine and too wonderful for us to comprehend. And I want to tell you this, and this should, this should bring you great comfort. There is more of God to know. There is more of Christ for you and I to know, to experience, to gnosko, than we will ever know this side of eternity. And that should give us great excitement, great joy. We're never going to exhaust the capacity, our capacity to gnosko God in this beautiful way. Uh, Callisto Swear, Eastern Orthodox Bishop, said, We see that it is not the task of Christianity to provide easy answers to every question, but to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God is not so much the object of our knowledge as the cause of our wonder. And there is so much more I could say on this subject. Um, simply put, when, when scientists are now, by studying quantum science and quantum physics, what they are studying and what they are learning about the, the very nature and fabric of reality and the universe around us is mind-blowing. I mean, recognizing that everyone and everything in the universe is connected, uh, that there is the, a shared consciousness that holds the universe together, that there are endless multiple realities and dimensions of space and time beyond our universe, that time itself is an illusion. Um, it's phenomenal. I, I want to read a famed physicist, Sir James Jean. I found this quote as I was researching my book, and it just blew my mind. This was published in, in one of the most prestigious science journals uh, uh, in, in the world. Okay, This is not a religious journal. This is a scientific journal. And James Jean, Sir James Jean, Sir James Jean, a physicist, said this. He said, the stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical, that's a non-material, reality. The universe begins to look more and more like a great thought or a great consciousness than a great machine. Mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We ought rather hail it, consciousness, as the creator and governor of the realm of matter. And again, these are huge implications that scientists are now uh, understanding. And here again is the crazy thing. As scientists uh, who are studying quantum science and quantum physics continue to study these things, what they are realizing is that, um, and many others are realizing, is they're saying the same things, the things that mystics have been saying from Hinduism and Buddhism and Christian mystics and, and others have been saying, uh, Native Americans have been saying for thousands of years. And now the science is confirming these exact same things. And what I find amazing is the scientists are communicating these ideas with way more excitement and way more joy uh, than, than, um, than the theologians are, right? And the reason why I think this is is that um, the scientists uh, are, are they, they know that they don't have all the answers. They know they don't have it figured out. Theologians think they've got it all figured out. And so uh, it's, it's wonderful to see these scientists so excited, so breathless uh, as they, in their discoveries because it truly is amazing. And I think we need to recapture this sort of amazement, this joy, this wonder as we embrace mystery, as we continue to pursue, to gnosko, to know God in these intimate ways. Really, there's so much more I want to share with you. I'm getting near the end of my time. Um, but uh, I guess I would say if I could, um, never settle for a glass of certainty when you can become immersed in the endlessly unfolding ocean of the mystery that is Christ. Um, hold loosely to your beliefs, practicing, I think, and I don't know. Socrates said, the only true wisdom is in knowing that you know nothing. And Albert Einstein said this, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is, is as though everything is a miracle. I know how I want to live my life. Do you? I hope so. Uh, again, my name is Keith Giles. Uh, thank you for sharing this time with me. I hope this has been inspiring to you and exciting to you. Um, if you want to connect even further, you can find me on my blog uh, at Pathios. That's at KeithGiles.com. Uh, I'm also the co-host of the Heretic Caviar podcast. I host a solo podcast called Second Cup with Keith 
which is available. All, both podcasts are available anywhere you listen to podcasts. I also co-host a podcast with Matthew DiStefano called Apostates Anonymous, which is a lot of fun, and you can listen to that as well. Uh, my books are available on Amazon, in print, Kindle, and audio. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Search Keith Giles, you'll find me. And uh, I would love to get to know you more and hear your thoughts about mystery and knowing God in a way that transcends information and knowledge and a more intimate connection with God that leads us into all truth, which again is higher and wider and longer and deeper than we could ever comprehend. Thank you.